Hello, everybody. Today, we are bringing on Charlotte Constance, the founder of Conductor. They are based in London, and they are orchestrators of thriving societies. And you guys are going to learn what a thriving society means and how do you orchestrate that during this interview with Charlotte. It was a lot of fun. Again, it's great bringing on people that aren't actual operators, but they are the consultants or they're the researchers in this new field. So they are determined to set up a new type of business, focusing their clients on the participants of places and spaces as the starting point for development. Charlotte set up Conductor. The business has firm foundations in research, understanding the wants and desires of participants and the actual needs of communities. The aim of Conductor is to combine this practice with industry-leading development strategies to create both the best social and financial returns Growing up in South Africa, Charlotte was acutely aware of the delicate social fabric of communities and the effect that people's living conditions have on their well-being, state of mind, and ability to move forward in life. Her aim is to make a difference in the way people live, focusing their homes and living environments so that individuals feel happy, supported, and secure, and in turn can look out after themselves, their loved ones, and contribute to their community in a positive way. Charlotte has over 17 years of experience working within the built environment for highly regarded real estate businesses. Her enterprising, entrepreneurial, and empathetic nature led her to set up Conductor in 2014. The business has grown considerably and continue, currently works with some of the most forward-thinking developers, funds, and social housing providers in both the UK and on a global scale. Their insights into how people live, coupled with their desire to orchestrate these thriving societies, make them a truly interesting bunch to work with. And again, this is the firm that some of the largest co-living operators bring in to consult when they go to develop their co-living communities. And, you know, I was introduced to her a few weeks back. We had an incredible conversation and I said she had to come on the show and talk about this publicly because, again, it's coming from a different perspective, not from the actual operator, but somebody that consults with some of the largest co-living operators currently being developed. And just and, she, and you guys are going to love this interview. Um, I just love how she looks at building community. And again, and we dive into participants, not passengers, when you're using space, especially in the built environment. And then we also go into depth on the London market and real estate in the UK. So I know you guys are going to love this interview with Charlotte, the founder of Conductor in London. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another weekly episode of the Co-Living Code Show. I'm Christine. I'm bringing on experts from around the world to talk about co-living. It is so much fun. You know, again, usually we have operators on and the founders of Concepts, but today, like I said in the bio, we have Charlotte with Conductor. She is out in London, and they are a research and marketing firm, and they have worked with some large co-living concepts. Um, in the UK and also globally. And, you know, it, definitely she knows her stuff. So we had uh, talked <laughs> back, yeah, and, and we had such an incredible conversation. I was like, okay, we have to get you on the show to speak about, you know, the best way to, again, design spaces, use spaces, you know, what is the definition of co-living? Like all these fun questions we're going to go through on the show today. Um, and so welcome. Thank you so much, Charlotte, for coming on today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and then, so, so tell us, I definitely want to know, um, why did you start Conductor? You guys uh, started back in 2014, correct? Yes, exactly. Um, so we've been going for five years now. Um, many reasons why I started the business. Um, kind of the entrepreneurial spirit, wanted to create something. Um, also wanted to create a business that had a purpose and was um, had direction that had impact socially. Um, but really, um, been having worked in the development world in the UK for about 13 years and in the built environment for even longer, um, I, I was just, it was troubling me <laughs> immensely that there's so many developments springing up, um, regeneration, individual buildings, um, obviously thinking mainly kind of from a residential perspective, um, that were the process of product development um, was 
based on the site, uh, what the local authority kind of dictated, and how many homes you could squeeze in or flats you could fit, or condos as you guys call them. <laughs> um, and there wasn't a lot of work being done early on to identify actual needs and wants and who was gonna live, work, play in those spaces and places. So we wanted to create a business that was able to evidence participants, and we'll talk about what, you know, what we define participants, but wanted to really evidence uh, and base um, briefs for master planners and for architects on data rather than on coming at it just from a design. So to kind of create a bit of a, a seamlessness in that, in that process of, of design of product. And it sounds like you guys are like the first step, right? They come to you before they even start designing or the architects. Are you guys brought in just from day one, typically? That's the idea. And, and as we grow and as our influence grows and we become better known, that's happening more and more. Um, and sometimes the architects are a bit like, oh, who are these people? Um, but in the main, because of the work that our insights team is doing, it actually makes their job so much easier. And we're getting feedback around the planning process, which um, in the UK is very intricate. Um, and we're getting feedback to say that that process that we're involved in is, is making that uh, much smoother than it might have been because there's data and evidence to back up the, the product and the design. And then, so let's talk about, you know, and this is a question I'm sure you get asked a lot already and, and myself included, is how do you define co-living? So this is a debate that we're constantly having. And I think that um, co-living is oftentimes in this country seen as micro-living. So when um, the local governments and the GLA, GLA, the Greater London Authority and so on, hear the word co-living, they hear small homes. And this is a bit of an issue because actually the way we look at co-living is not dissimilar to co-working. Obviously, it's all part of this co, the sharing revolution, this co-revolution. So for us, co-living is about community living. It's about sharing. It's about not necessarily living in a small home, but it's having shared spaces and shared experiences, um, which as we know from the world over, this is an, you know, a trend that's here to stay. So yeah, we're about community living um, as opposed to micro homes, two different things. Sometimes they come together, but they're not necessarily one in the same. That is so interesting that the UK, that that's, that they default to think it's like micro suites in a building. And then mm -hmm. in the States, everybody thinks it's a bunch of people, like 30 to 50 people in one single family home. <laughs> that's what people think. That, that Co-housing. Because I saw on one of your other po podcasts that um, there was a researcher from Westminster and she was talking about co-living and you said, ah, oh, I'm glad you're not talking about co-housing. So, so there's all these different things going on and maybe not necessarily the, the definitions aren't there. Maybe that's something we need to be doing. Yes. Well, we, well our team did do the Wikipedia. We finally separated co-living from co-housing earlier this year on Wikipedia and we were so excited. It took months. Well, it took like, <laughs> took like four months to do that. Because again, co-housing and co-living are so different, but they were, it was lumped under co-housing. Um, so yeah, but again, the definition is still getting fleshed out. If you guys check Wikipedia, it changes like every week. So <laughs> more people need to contribute, I think. Um, so the, you know, let's, you know, what, what about the ethos? Like, how do you feel? What are the ethos in, in Connector's opinion about that, that characterize co-living? So I think it stems, where it comes from is important and why people want it. Um, and it's, it's because people are moving to cities and there's more, more and more urbanization um, and there's a need for more housing supply. I mean, London is, it's, you, you know in the press, it's a constant, it's just 
always. How are we going to fill this gap that we have? Um, but really, the, the, for, for us, the principles of co-living come back to um, almost the way the world's going, the kind of fourth industrial revolution, the sharing economy, um, the way people want to live and work. And it's not just millennials, because we're not allowed to stop saying that. <laughs> it's about all age groups, yeah. even retirees. It's about people communing. It's about people participating, about um, people coming together to, to share exper experiences and a lifestyle that makes their lives better than it would have been if they'd been living on their own. And really that's what it's got to do. It's got to enrich, it can't take away, it's got to add to people's lives. And for us, that's what we're looking when we're, when we're working with our clients. We're always looking at that. How does it make people's lives better? How can we help people to thrive? New and Charlotte, you just said it again, the, the, and I loved when you'd said it the first time when we had chatted a couple weeks ago, the participants versus passengers. Like, I would love for you to elaborate on that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So, and and my, my team at work is getting a bit annoyed with me because I keep hopping on about this participants, not passengers. But um, it, it kind of stems from the work, as I said, that we're doing around insights. So we've created a system called participant profiling. And it's kind of target, it's target audience profiling. But the reason we use the word participant is um, because it's not just about the people who are going to live in a building or come to work in a place. It's about the community. And it's about the kind of halo effect that any space or place has on, uh, has on a community and, 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 and its locality. So for us, what we're, what we're trying to do in what you call multifamily, we call it build to rent um, here in the UK, co-living. I mean, build to rent has an element of co-living to it. Even new build homes for sale that have amenity space have an element of co-living. But really, really in this kind of rental world and, and sharing economy, we're thinking about how do people feel a sense of ownership and stewardship because they'll stay for longer and you'll create a community if people have a, a, a sense of belonging. And if people have some kind of an ownership, even if they're renting, then they're likely to look after the place more. It's likely to be more of a, you know, <laughs> the, the success of the development or the success of the building, the occupancy rates will be higher and so on and so forth. So we often hear, how do we create a community? No, developers and operators don't create communities, they facilitate them. And so we're talking about how do the spaces, the places, and then the activities that take place get people to participate in that community so they get to know each other and so that they feel a sense of belonging so that they stay. So that's what we're going. So you can't really live in a co-living building and just be a passenger, you know, come home. You know, you've got to, you've got to get involved. And North, you North Americans are way better... <laughs> at that than maybe the, <laughs> the Europeans are or the, the English and, it, and it's a known fact. Um, so in the UK, we really have to think carefully about um, how we get people to participate and also the balance between organized fun, <laughs> which some people just don't like. I don't really like organized fun, if I'm completely honest. Prefer a bit of spontaneity. Um, so the organized fun that the operator kind of puts together versus that organic kind of bonding and fun that happens naturally. Um, so we're, when we're talking about participation, we're looking at those two different things and how we cultivate um, community and participation. No, and you're right. I, there's two schools of thought on events, right? And in creating, you know, like you said, forcing them to go to events, facilitating events versus something spontaneous. So it's yeah. kind of because I've seen it done. I mean, Zoku, which I've probably mentioned before, they've yeah. nailed it. 
they've nailed it. Yes. And Hof Hans, I've been, I think he's going to come on the show in a couple of weeks. Finally, he's such a busy guy. Many ways. Yes. They, they've nailed on, <laughs> They've nailed a lot of things. You're exactly right. Um, but, but the events, the, the way that they had these incredible events planned and they would literally walk over to me and say, Hey, Christine, like we really, can you come tomorrow night to our, you know, live jazz music? Like, so, so they were, they're super proactive at like, getting people to the planned event and it still felt really cool because some people, people are so busy, right? So they might not plan events or do things spontaneously, but if they're kind of pushed a little bit, um, that's, that, that was really unique. That's the one time I've seen it done, you know, facilitated really well. Um, and they have amazing turnouts, but it's a lot of work and, to do that. What's interesting about that is it's actually the people who've invited you as opposed to technology or um, an email or it's a personal relationship. Um, and that's, you know, th that really is what it comes down to is the individuals who are running these spaces and places ultimately as well. They need the facilities and the spaces to do it, but it's also that culture. We do a lot of work um, with our clients around their brand and their brand values and what is their, you know, what are they, what does it stand for? And we were speaking earlier about Node, um, who's, who's one of our clients and Anil Kara, who really understood the kind of student world and has brought that into, I was gonna say grown-ups, <laughs> that's the wrong word, a more mature market. Um, but, you know, one of the things that they have are their, their curators and their, their teams on the ground in their various locations are so important to them. Um, they've got all of the, the stuff going on in terms of product development and technology and all of that stuff, but those people who run their buildings are handpicked and trained and part of the Node family and they know one another and that you, you can tell that. Um, so yeah, participation can be facilitated by technology and the amenity space, but ultimately the people are going to make it happen. No, you're exactly right. And then humans. hopefully, yes, humans. And then hopefully Neil's <laughs> watching or listening to this episode because he's, I, I keep, he's supposed to come on soon too. Um, and we've had great conversations. Come on, Anil. <laughs> yes, Anil, now you have to come on the show. And then I am actually meeting with one of their community curators on Friday to tour one of the properties. Um, here in Los Angeles. And so, uh, yeah, I'll, uh, it'll be nice to see. And you're right. You know, I think it's, it's having that point person at each property that is a human that's actually helping introduce the residents and connect and tell them about events. Yeah. And, and interestingly, their initial node offering um, in Dublin and in the, in the U.S. and their other sites that are going on is not micro living but it's co-living. So, um, you know, watch the space, maybe in the future, they might, you know, have different types of products and so on. But um, certainly, certainly the way they are positioned is as a co-living brand. And so they should be because that's what they're doing. They're, they're facilitating community living, not, in, not necessarily in small spaces. No, that makes sense. And then how about, so how does co-living relate to some of the other clients you guys have worked with already? So it's a very hot topic of discussion currently. Um, and there's, as I said, in, in the UK, um, I think there is this kind of miss, you know, kind of this definition really needs to be looked at. Um, but certainly our clients increasingly, um, partly because um, we're, we're really trying to get people on this kind of, mo in this movement of um, our kind of purpose, which is thriving societies and orchestrating thriving societies. But our clients are increasingly becoming aware of um, social issues, loneliness, um, on, on that kind of side of things. They're also thinking about um, time, to, time to market and how quickly they can develop and, and provide homes. 
Obviously, they're also thinking commercially about how to make money. And we believe that those things can, you know, they can go together. It's okay to have a purpose and make money. Like it's not a, you know, it's not a sin. So, but certainly this idea of um, urbanization and increasing loneliness and um, people not being able to live in um, central locations um, and how, how sustainability, so how co-living and sharing services and so on. So it's top of the agenda for, um, for all of our, our um, clients who are working on big regeneration projects throughout the UK or uh, individual buildings or mixed use or whatever it is. And many of them are thinking about what, you know, co-movement or co-evolution. So how do we have, um, how do we bring co-working into it? How do we bring these elements of co-living? How do we bring in sharing? Um, how do we create um, that stewardship and that I spoke about earlier? Um, and as investment pours in to the UK in the build to rent side, so our clients are increasingly going to be retaining those assets, those buildings for five, 10, 15 years and beyond. Whereas before many of them were building, selling, moving on to the next thing. So they have a vested interest in, in the health of that building and the participants in the long term. Um, so there's a massive shift happening in, in the UK, um, especially where the, the, the shift in, in kind of what, how, how we provide these, these homes and services to people. And thank goodness, because um, because we need, we need the developers to take responsibility for the people and the communities in the long term, not just the five years or the 10 years that they're, they're developing. So the, the, so the co-living in the truest sense is, is, is on people's minds in a big way. No, and, and that's really exciting to hear. And I love, you know, thriving societies. I don't, I, how do you come up? Your team must love these. <laughs> how do you come up with these great, you know, <laughs> thriving? I mean, that is such a great. We go to the pub. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so, you have a couple of glasses of wine and you're like, yeah, you come up with these amazing, you know, just, and again, last time we had talked about that, that was so great. Just, I was like taking notes because the terms you were using, it's like thriving societies. I mean, again, that the stat that everybody's heard, you know, the UN has said there's going to be 70% of people living in major cities around the world in 2050. Okay. That is a lot of people in major cities. How are these people going to live together, interact with each other? You know, I think co-working has, you know, it's been a decade of showing how people, strangers can use space successfully and actually collaborate. And, and I love what co-working has done um, mm -hmm. in that sense and gotten everybody out of cubicles. And, you know, it's, it's been really cool to see now how we interact in a working environment in built mm. space, but now how do we do that in a living environment in these major cities around the world? So, you know, yeah. creating these thriving societies where everybody's kind of, you know, growing together, sharing space. Um, it's, I mean, you're, I'm super excited to hear developers are now <laughs> finally realizing what's going on, right? And then do yeah. you know, real quick, Charlotte, do you know, the, I don't off the top of my head, uh, what, what percentage of people rent in London? Do you have any rough estimate versus own homes? I, I should know this. Um, I don't. I don't know the exact percentage. I know it's a very high proportion and increasingly so, obviously, given the fact that the affordability and, and purchasing is... Um, but there's, you know, we've been having this debate about who are, because, because I think the other thing we need to remember about co-living is that it's not for everybody. <laughs> you don't <laughs> say that's you everybody. Don't, you, don't, like, you don't have to do it, you know, and, and it's, a, it's, it's, it's such a small part of the market at the moment and it's, it's increasing. Um, but it's, and there's a lot of personal opinion around it. Oh, well, I wouldn't want to share my kitchen with 
you know, people or whatever. And it's like, we always say to our clients, yeah, but you're not the, the audience. We're not building this for you, you know. We're building this for people who are coming out of, you know, graduates or people who want to come to the city from a new place and meet people. You know, that's one of the biggest audiences of this globalization that's happening is, is you know, when you, when you go to Berlin from the US to go or to Amsterdam, you want to go into a space like that because, as you said yourself, why go into an apartment and close the door in a new city, you know? Fast track, friends. Um, so... Sorry, I'm going, I'm going yeah, off the I love topic. It, I love it. No, it is. <laughs> but yes, in terms of, of renting, we have the private rented sector. We have then build to rent, which is new build, purpose build rental. And then we almost have this co-living emerging, which could be micro, or is it actually just the way people are wanting to live. So it's almost like we need to go to the, the GLA, the Greater London Authority and, and or, or the, house, the Minister of Housing or whatever and actually get your definitions of Wikipedia and put another one in there for, for micro homes and then start defining this. Um, because yeah, it's, it's, it's not, it, not everybody has to share a kitchen. <laughs> That's what I keep saying. Yeah, no, 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 no. And I've said it, anytime I speak, you know, and I was there in London speaking a couple months ago and I knew I was speaking in front of, you know, oh my gosh, there's, it's going to be, you know, you know, maybe people, you know, 40 to 60 years old and these are property investors in London and they're just going to be like, they just might not get it. Luckily, it was actually well received. <laughs> Co-living was, I think they're understanding, you know, that, yeah, it's not, it doesn't have to be for them, but for the, the tenants they're renting to in these different, you know, apartment schemes there in the UK that they, you know, this is their clientele that might just be there for, you know, working for Google. They might just be there for six months or a year, you know, and they want instant friends and they want, you know, and again, I'm, I, now it's so fun that I'm on the opposite end of, you know, the operator. And now I'm the actual user jumping from, you know, country to country. Now I'm back in California for like a month or two. And same thing, I'm like, so now I'm co-living, which is exciting, but it's like, well, do I buy a car again? Or do I rent a car? Or do I share a car? Um, all, the, all the things that we have to think about with this global sharing economy and people that want to jump, you know, to relocate, you know, frequently, you know, how, how do they, how are they able to do that? And you, and you are a prime example of that type of person. And there are many examples like you where you need to be able to plug and, you know, arrive, plug and play. You need to be able to in, like, integrate into something because you're a social human being and you want to do that, even if it's only for a month or two. And guarantee that you will make some connections in that month or two as a result of doing what you're doing, that will either be a lifelong friend or a really good business connection or whatever. So there's, you know, it's that open-minded mentality and that participation that allows you to do that. And there's lots of people like you. And there's lots of people who are going to live in their, the same house that they lived in for 20 years and never go anywhere. Fine. That's great. Um, but let's think about what, you know, the the world how the world especially in cities is changing um and cater for that because that's what people are need, are desiring and needing and with your clients i know you talked about you know because everybody says millennials 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 and i think that's because that is the current bulk of yeah. the user of co-living is 25 to 35 year olds those are millennials with your clients, are you educating them on, okay, actually, let's start building for Gen Z. Let's start, like, how are intergenerational or seniors? Like, how, how do you guys just start defining the clientele when you're in the planning phase? So I still, I still feel like a young person, <laughs> and I think I'm past the millennial. Um, but, you know, we've been, we've, we've recently been hiring some properly young people into our business, um, which is, which is so refreshing. Um, and yes, we are absolutely looking at, um, what 
15 year olds are thinking and doing because in five years time when some of these developments got get built out they're going to be the target audience um and we're looking at you know we're looking always at trends um, and exploring and opening our minds beyond property and the built environment and looking at you know, the way in which deliveries are going to be made and the way in which people are going to be communicating. Like we all think WhatsApp is, you know, what's, that, what's the next thing, what's coming. But similarly, we also have uh, clients in what we call later living, so mature living. Um, and we've been working, you know, in that, in that world. And we are seeing those type of people wanting to um, come back and live in communities, but maybe not in an old fashioned walls covered in magnolia and floral wallpaper kind of way, in a much more kind of urban and they want to be close to their kids maybe, they want to sell their big homes and free up capital. Um, there's a fantastic um, lady called Anna who's um, started a, a company called Birch Grove, which is which is rental in later living, and and she talks a lot about this this stuff, um, and she knows you know that audience particularly well. So it's not just the Gen Zs, no, it's you know beyond. It's the full spectrum of of people who want community. And I think actually there's some really good examples of that in, in um, the Nordic countries where older people have mixed with younger people and creches and, and you know, primary schools and later living. And, it, and it's, it's like, well, that's, that makes sense because we would never advise our clients to create a proposition that, that excluded all of the different types of people because ultimately a community is about lots of different types of people. It's more of the mindset of community living, which is important as opposed to the age or the demographic. Yes, exactly. It is mindset for sure over age because it can be any age. And again, I think we're going to see the ranges change over the years. You know, it's maybe not, it's just going to be a bulk of 25 to 35 year olds. I think that's going to change um, drastically in the years to come. And then the next question is, and I get this asked a lot too, this is why I'm asking you, is <laughs> affordable housing. So, yes. so obviously your clients you're working with now, I know it's more, you know, the, the rent amount, it's not considered affordable housing. Do you see that coming up soon in any sectors, any areas? Uh, and, you know, absolutely. And I think this is, um, this is this constant, um, we, we're, we're constantly trying to find the, ba the, the balance. So um, some of our clients have premium brands and charge premium prices for their products. Um, but you can't necessarily uh, go take that product that you've always developed in zone one or two in London, for example, and put that in zone six. So what is the product that still has the ethos and the values of the business, but how is it delivered in such a way with quality and good customer experience, but at a more affordable, at a, in, a, in a more affordable way. And it's this constant, uh, you know, our clients have all, <laughs> all sorts going on in terms of trying to get through planning, trying to buy the land, trying to get the numbers to stack up, and then, and then, and then, they still have to make some money and they still have to provide homes that are affordable. So, you know, they, what they're faced with is unbelievable. But um, we're seeing a big emergence of um, housing associations um, who are historically providing social housing within the UK, now providing private housing but at a more affordable rate and I'm a non-exec of a, a housing association that um, is really you know thinking about this as well um, and often the micro homes is coming from an affordability perspective so if the home's smaller it's cheaper to rent out the, the developer can get more homes into one space so they're making more of a profit so it's a win-win 
Um, so, so yes, it's, it's, it's constantly on everybody's minds. Um, and I think it's, yeah, it's, it's certainly something that our clients are trying to do more and more. But the reality is, is that there's so much else at play that it's not always possible. So, but I'm glad it's, that. yeah, no, but I'm glad to hear it's at least being discussed now. So that's, you know, that, that it's coming up in conversation um, and they're trying to figure out. And I think common, yeah, common here in the States is even, I think they're, they're starting to work on a model now that they've kind of perfected the, the co-living model at a larger scale. Um, in a premium price now how do they do that just like you explained you explained it perfectly like how do we we take those other things into consideration to make it affordable to still do community living yeah. so um, I love hearing that and then okay so again talking about London and I, I love it the best my favorite part about this show is I get to talk to people from all over the world different countries <laughs> every country is different so so let's talk let's dive a little bit deeper into this stigma and, and I know you did touch on it a little bit already in London you know with the micro suites is there are there any other stigmas in London when it comes to co-living um no, I, well, yes, there is. I think there's, um, there's the, what we have permitted development, which is the ability to turn commercial into residential without going through all the, jumping through all the planning hoops or not as many. And um, some of that's been done, uh, being done quite well. Um, and the, some is being done terribly and cheaply and not providing safe and, and healthy homes for people. So there's also this that's coming in play because uh, some of those developers doing not such a good job are calling that co-living. So it's, it's really um, graying the waters of, of this definition of co-living because people go, oh, well, that's this PD permitted development. So once again, there's the size, there's this kind of um, maybe some uh, developers not taking responsibility in the way that they should and just making a quick buck. Um, and that's tainting what's being done on the, on the, on the people who are doing it properly. Um, and there's, there's always people just trying to line their pockets, obviously, without purpose, without thinking about why co-living is important for the future. So almost ruining it for the rest who are wanting to do it properly. So there's, there's, there's all sorts politically, I would say, that, that's going on that um, is, is not allowing this kind of asset class to be defined, this co-living to be, to be kind of um, defined in the way that it should be. Um, it yeah. With your, with your clients, do you guys do you advise them on minimum stays at all? And again, I know London has specific rules already. Is it like okay, make sure it's a month minimum, make sure it's three months, six months, a year to facilitate community, or hey, keep it less of a short, do more short terms, so then you can cater to these you know kind of global citizens. Um, how do you see that? We, I think, uh, given the ethos in terms of our creation of, you know, orchestration of thriving societies. I think we feel that there should be some kind of longevity to a co-living space that people, because of the participation, people need to commit to it and kind of give it, you know, what it deserves. Um, on the flip side of that, the transient kind of nature of some of the coming and goings of people dropping in for a month and dropping out can add real flavor to the existing community. So what we're advising is to look at, um, you know, each place and space on its own in, in terms of the location, what the local community needs and wants, what people staying there want and with, and the likelihood of them staying long-term or short-term and whether there is the ability to almost have a hybrid model of people, the, the, the kind of fixed community and the more transient. And I think there's a great example that's coming is a tech farm in Sweden, in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. and, 
they've come on the show. Yeah. Yeah. You know, where they're looking at how their building is going to work to cater for the, I think they call them introverts and extra. I, 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 I can't remember, but um, I, I think that they're really, they're really looking at, at segmenting their space in a way that caters for different types of people. It's not one size fits all. And, and you know, if you've got good opera operations going on and you're able to think about how that works and the level of service for different people, you can start looking at your pricing structure according to short stays, long stays. I use the amenity more than you use the amenity. You know, you can start getting, getting a bit creative rather than here's... 300 micro homes, everybody's doing the same thing. You have to stay for a minimum of X amount of time, take it or leave it. So it's building in that flexibility. Um, and you only do that by knowing and getting the insight into who's gonna, who's actually going to be your audience or your customers. And that is incredible advice for people listening. People that, because there's so many people right now that are about to embark on building out a 300 unit community. You know, and I think they're trying to figure this out. I agree 110% with you, and I'm definitely an advocate for the hybrid model. Um, but again, having at least a bulk of the people as, you know, long-term residents, it builds that yeah. sense of community. And then you have, you know, like how you said, it kind of adds flavor, right? So you have people just, you know, that might come in for a month or three months, and, and it, it just, it, it shifts. Exactly. Yeah, it just really adds to the community, you know, versus stagnant. It's the same, you know, in co-housing, sometimes those people will purchase and they'll be there for 20 years and it'll be the same exact people yeah. in the community for 20 years. Um, and I've always, you know, the places I've lived in, it's really fun where you have a core group and then you have some people coming in and out simultaneously. It's a hybrid model. Um, so yeah, great, great advice. So my last question for you, Charlotte, is where do you see co-living going in the next five, 10 years? Ah, you didn't tell me you were going to ask that now. <laughs> <laughs> um, where do I see it going? Um, I think it's, I think it's in its infancy, which is hugely exciting. I think it's here to stay. Um, I think that there is going to be more work done around um, really figuring out what the proposition is. But similarly, I think people are going to keep coming up with um, interesting kind of propositions. So buildings that cater for a certain mindset as we were talking about and so on. Um, yeah, and I think and I think more and more people are going to want to come together, and 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 it, we we see it with you going to Burning Man and communities, and you know we there's so many examples throughout the world. If we look outside of of bricks and mortar, where there are movements and sharing and people doing these things and coming together in, in their like-mindedness and that's just on the rise. So it has to, you know, it, it has to just go from strength to strength. And also the people working, uh, the developers and the operators in this sector of co-living are not necessarily traditionally property people. They're tech people or they're from different backgrounds. So we're just seeing all this exciting uh, new ideas being injected and new ways of thinking and and that's that's just going to be kind of on on the increase um, so um, what I'd like to see somehow is uh, people who are renting being able to have some kind of ownership of something um, so I'd like to see, um, and, and there is an, there is another example of this, um, in Australia and I can't remember the name of it, but, uh, maybe you can have a look, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but where, where, um, there is the ability to, um, your rental goes towards, uh, you know, a, almost a rent to buy eventually, or um, you have a share in, in something, you've invested in something, even if it's a small 
proportion of your rent each month. Um, because that is going to, that is an issue is that so much of people's rent is going towards, uh, so much of people's um, salaries and so on is going towards rent and they've got experiences to show for it, but not necessarily anything tangible. So it would be good to see some of our co-living developers and operators thinking about how they can get they can give something back to the people who are, are paying them rent every month. That's a challenge to Yes, it's a challenge to the listeners because I've mentioned it before and even when I speak on stage oh. I, I talk about it is fractional ownership. So yeah. who's gonna be the person? Again, I'm too busy, so please somebody else take that idea. <laughs> But it might be somebody in the mortgage. You know, I have friends in the mortgage industry and I have friends in finance. And it might be those brilliant brains that, that have to redo their model because I keep telling them, I go, nobody's going to I mean, these, they're not going to do a 30-year mortgage for the same house in the same city. For the, you know, they're just not. But how do we, how can someone pay, you know, portion to own something, but maybe that's, it's ownership somewhere, anywhere in the world, <clears throat> but at least they own something something equity in something yeah um, yeah yeah so that'll be that'll be exciting to see see that and I think you're right because so much money is spent on rent um, again and it's for the flexibility but is there a way to tie that to some sort of ownership or even partial yeah. ownership but uh, yeah so exciting stuff to come well thank you again Charlotte so such a great interview again we love bringing in you know a Pe Penny Clark who you mentioned she was the researcher uh, yeah. there also yeah so her I got amazing feedback from that episode so a lot of times people love hearing you know from other directions of this industry you know yeah. you guys see things differently than an, an actual operator would so um, obviously we'll have your contact information in the show notes, your website for Conductor, beautiful website, by the way, so people can, uh, <laughs> can check it out. <laughs> if they're get re getting ready to, to start a project, definitely Charlotte knows her stuff and knows a lot about this industry <laughs> and creating thriving societies, which, which is a great, great thing to do in this world. So thank you so much. Thank you. Lovely to speak to you. Bye. 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 Thank you so much for checking out today's episode. If you want to learn more about co-living, you could check out my book on Amazon, The Co-Living Code. And of course, if you're looking for the perfect software to power your co-living concept, check out kindred.io, K-N-D-R-D.io. Thanks. And a quick thank you to SPX Agency for all of the graphics, animation, and design on our YouTube channel.